So it was a challenge until I found the scripture that says, Therefore we will not depart from thee, quicken us, and we shall call upon thy name. Then I realized it was not my responsibility to, keep my, to pray. God will have to quicken me. It is after he has done that, that I can call upon his name. And that revelation entered so strong. I was trying to pray by my will. I was trying to pray because I desired it. Then I now discovered that there was a partnership in prayer between you and the Holy Spirit. And you are going to pray to the extent to which it quickens you. So, when I wanted to launch in prayer, I will begin to pray in tongues, expecting that the Holy Spirit will begin to quicken me. So the tempo that I sustain at every point in time in my prayer delivery was consistent to the quickening grace that the Holy Spirit administered in my vessel. Then I saw that I could gain ascendancy, I could, I could migrate, I could move, and I moved based on the resources of quickening that he made available. And then prayer became interesting. Prayer became an adventure. Prayer became something that I, I, I began to look forward to. Then I began to build prayer competence. Then I discovered what prayer competence did to my study life. It gave life to it. Now, so not everything will, will be given. Some you need to cultivate. But we need to be competent and confident in order for us to discharge our labor for the kingdom. Come with me quickly. Book of Acts chapter 1. So where you are sitting now, you know what you need to develop. And you know what you do almost naturally. One of the things that Jesus emphasized in his training program was that the business of the kingdom was, was a globalized kind of enterprise. A globalized enterprise. Now it is different when you do business and it's on small scale. Maybe you have a bakery somewhere in Joss. And your bakery, your, your kind of bread is most sought after in the city of Joss. Everybody wants to, drink, uh, to eat your bread. Your brand is well known in the city. And you are doing very well in business. You see, that's your business that is territorial is not a good illustration of the kind of enterprise that Jesus was bringing his apostles into because the apostolic business is a global business he said but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria unto the uttermost part of the earth. There's a progression that is sustained, but the scope of the engagement is global. Now, the way that bakery, are you with me? You are not with me. The way that bakery, the bakery that they are running in Jaws, that has gained ground in just the way they run that business and the way international businesses like total is being run is different from local businesses now it's, there's an outlook that you must have if you are going to be an enterprising kingdom functionary and jesus was trying to get them to understand the scope of engagement how many of you have, you, maybe you did a little business, you sold something, either you offered some service and you made services and you made money? How many of you? Now, you see, it means you did business at some point. But what I'm talking about is the concept of global business is different from your own localized business that you did in the backyard and got some profit. The apostolic template that Jesus gave to his disciples can operate anywhere, irrespective of nation or tribe. It is a template that is not restricted to a territory. 
The same template will work in Japan. The same template will work in France. The same template will work in Mangu. See, it's a template that can create the same effect, provide the same effect in different territories because the scope is global. Hallelujah. For instance, most of the preachers in the Nigerian church are only preachers in the Nigerian context. If you take them out of the Nigerian context, the, the message that they preach, in which they are competent of, they are going to be totally irrelevant in Europe. Because what we are preaching here is an emphasis on blessing and prosperity. Meanwhile, in Sweden, the economy is so good. In, in Canada, the economy is so wonderful that a relative of mine that stayed in Canada for a long time called me up in the morning and said, Pastor, be, be, be sincere to me. Why do we need to pray? Because he has electricity. He has enough money. He has health care. He doesn't pray for water. He's okay. So he, he's now asking me, Hey, when I was in Africa, when we were doing this prayer thing, we were praying because we had needs and all of that. I don't have any needs, so tell me now. Why should I pray? You see, the kind of message he received in Africa was from people and ministries that were operating in such a way that the global perspective of things was not sustained. So they developed territorial, Africanized perspectives that was affected by location. And so when he left that location, he was no longer, the things he learned were no longer relevant where he was. Meanwhile, the template that Jesus gave the apostles is not supposed to become irrelevant just because there's a change of location. It's a globalized template. Oh my God, you are not with me. I seek wisdom from the Lord to be able to explain this. Because most of you have already taken off on the wrong foot. So I'm, I'm trying, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to redeem you. So that all of us can, can, can have new eyes and new lenses. To see... Um, the enterprise that Jesus has called us into and we are ambassadors of that enterprise in our various territories as we go back to our states and our zones. He called me up and said, why do we pray? If I ask you, what, how will you respond to him? I think I need to define what an international ministry is. An international ministry is not having a branch of the ministry God has committed to you in every country. Because there are many ministries in Nigeria. When they go to, in London, are you with me? Please, don't be offended, okay? In London, the church they plant in London, 74% of the people are Yoruba. In Dubai, 80% of the congregation are Yoruba. In Lagos, 92% of the congregation are Yoruba. That's not an international ministry. That person has a mantle, an oil, an ordination to reach that the people group called Yoruba. So he goes to London to look for Yoruba people. Goes to France to look for Yoruba people. He goes to Jamaica to look for Yoruba people. If there are no Yoruba people anywhere, his ministry cannot flourish there. Those kind of limitations are not God-given limitations. No, it's not God that limited that ministry like that. It is a template they are running with which is not consistent with the kind of education that Jesus gave when he came to train his functionaries. 
You are not still getting me. I'm saying that based on the way you are developing yourself and your eye, your, 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 your vista, your perspective, you can be creating a limitation for your potential without knowing. Because you are not following the template. So that's not international ministry. If you, if you have an international ministry, if you move to the, to the U.S., we should see you at preaching to white people that are natives of the U.S. Then, it means what you have is relevant to the white people, is relevant to... Like, Idahosa had an international ministry. He preached to more blacks than any white and preached to more whites than any black. That's an international ministry. And if you are going to run that kind of ministry that is globally relevant, it means you were following your emphasis is the emphasis that Jesus gave them. The emphasis that Jesus gave them was the emphasis of the kingdom of God. Are you with me? Because the business you are called into is to extend the influence and the frontiers of that kingdom. And I would like to... So take some time, even if I, I don't finish my syllabus, because I have a long syllabus here, but I'll take my time. Anywhere we, we can get to for this morning session, we'll just cap it there. At least that's an introduction. I want to leave you with those thoughts. Maybe as you are brooding on it, God will show you areas of restriction that you have placed on your life. That is going to make you irrelevant to the people in Saudi Arabia. Some restrictions you have already placed on your life. Some kind of mentorship you have received. That is actually a limitation. Because it's not according to the blueprint that Jesus gave to his functionaries. Are you with me? The first limitation you are going to have is when you specialize. The, I am a deliverance minister. Have you heard that before? I am a prosperity preacher. When you specialize. Because what we see here is not specialization. What we see here is Jesus setting up a seminar to educate people and the, the subject of the education were things pertaining to the kingdom of God. It means that if you are a kingdom preacher, a kingdom functionary, even in Jamaica, your words will be gold. Because the center and the circumference of this, the teachings of this book called the Bible is about the kingdom of God. Now, so, for instance, let me test you. Who can tell me what the kingdom of God is? That's what Jesus taught. Hey, this is Bible study, so I need feedback. Kingdom of God. Okay, this lecture ends if there's no response. We'll just pray and, and say, Lord, take us as we are. That will be the prayer point, and then we'll end the session. I'm trying to do something. Yes, kingdom of God, what's it about? Anywhere God can find expression. If the word reign or rule is not in your definition, is wrong. Any sphere where God's authority is present... Are you with me? Why is it? Why is the word authority so critical? The word authority is so critical is because God cannot actualize the divine purpose until He exercises divine authority, and that's why it is only where God's authority is present that God's will can be done. Now, if we go out of this gate and you will see an unbeliever on the street, if someone has the gift of discernment of spirit, he can look at the unbeliever and probably know that this one was called to be a prophet. Alright? But the reason why he's not a prophet is because he's not saved. 
His salvation will bring him into a sphere where God can exercise his authority over his life. It is the exercise of that authority that can bring him to become God's intent, God's ordination. If he stays outside of the sphere of God's authority, he can never become what God has ordained for him. Are you with me? So we are talking about a, a realm, an estate that is managed by the government and the authority of God. Now, are you here? If you check your Bible, have you seen the scripture that in Psalms 103 that says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Indicative of the fact that we may not have perceived God accurately if we have not seen him as a king that is ruling. There are many, because the sum total of the revelation of the Bible is that God is a ruling king. In fact, the subject of the Bible is the subject of Christ and his kingdom. Christ and his kingdom. That's the, that's the summary of the Bible. That's the spirit of the Bible. That is, that is the concern, the burden of the Bible. You can actually preach prosperity. Hmm? And in your preaching of prosperity, it has no recourse to the fact that the one that is prospering you is a king. I can preach a prosperity of self where the recipient of the prosperity, because of the way it is presented, feels that the goal of Christianity is prosperity. Meanwhile, the reason why prosperity became relevant in the first place is because the Bible says we should seek first the kingdom. And we should seek to be right with the laws that are in that kingdom. And then the resources that we need to actualize that which God is doing with us and in us. We we'll navigate into our lives so that we can establish God's purpose and establish God's will. He didn't say we should seek things. He said as we seek the kingdom, as we seek to be right with the laws of that kingdom, then financial resources and material resources will navigate in our direction. It is possible for somebody to preach prosperity and he makes prosperity a goal. It means he has contradicted that protocol. The implication of that kind of preaching is that this believer now begins to seek things and then in a bid to seek things, he stumbles on a spirit called mammon and mammon will possess his soul. When mammon possesses your soul, mammon gives you a new kind of education. Mammon gives you a new kind of perspective. We can run a, a church system with the philosophy of mammon. And then the people that become elders in that company are people that have financial substance. It means mammon has renovated the landscape. The truth of the matter, at that point, the Holy Spirit becomes important to bring about changes to the system because the system was set in place by a spirit called mammon. You are not with me. Okay, since you are not with me, let's, let's. Let me teach the simple ones. You will, as the Lord leads you on, a day may come when you will need this one. That day, you will look for, you will arrange how. <laughs> ah! mm. Are you with me? The side of God that we pray to is the fatherhood of God. And that metaphor, father, actually reveals God's relational name. God's name of grace. That's what the metaphor symbolizes. There is a relational platform that we have in this new covenant by which we can actually experience God as Father. All of that infrastructure is put in place so that we can trust God's love. All of that infrastructure is put in place so that we can trust that our Father cannot be against us. All of that infrastructure was put in place so that we can understand that the thoughts that God has toward us are thoughts of good only and not of evil. That kind of confidence is as a result of experiencing that relational side of God. 
Then when we become confident in God, are you with me? All of that is supposed to build confidence. In fact, your resolve to live for God, to consecrate to God, as the only wise thing to do when dealing with a God that came and squandered so many resources just to bring you into safety. Your resolve to live for God is as a result of the fact that you have experienced His love. Now that you have experienced His love, you, have, you, have, you trust Him. Are you with me? Now, you want to reciprocate that love by wanting to do His will. You see, the open gate was the fatherhood dimension. But when you have entered into that open gate and trust has been developed by reason of the fact that in dealing with God, you have seen His fidelity. Now you want to go higher. And in your going higher, you are now trying to become a vessel through which the purposes of God can be executed. So you want to know God's will. You want to become a functionary that brings about the implementation of God's will. That's kingdom thinking. You see, you enter through salvation, relational possibilities, grace. But you see, the goal of that entrance is for you to participate in the realm where God's authority manages. Is that clear? Oh, you are not with me. I will keep striking until you get the point. I won't proceed. If not, because the subsequent issues are more complex. So we need to get the basic issues first. The book of John chapter 3, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the infrastructure for salvation that was put in place was designed so that we can pass through the door of salvation and then begin to participate in the kingdom. Because originally what God offered Adam in the Garden of Eden was kingdom, was dominion, not prosperity. It was not Adam's post that God lost in Eden. It was the fact that Adam could no longer operate under the authority of God because he has denied that authority by rebellion. So our salvation was put in place as an infrastructure to restore us into the original thing that God was offering, which is kingdom. Are you with me? And it happens to be that the kingdom of God is first and foremost established upon the hearts of men. That kingdom will begin to walk in your life. And as you yield to the authority of the king in your heart, his authority becomes stronger on your life. He begins to set up order in your life. And when he has set up order in your own life, that's when you become an instrument that can bring order in the name of the Lord because he has set up order in your own life. When you gave your life to Christ or before you gave your life to Christ, what you were good at was rebellion. Now that you have come into Christ and the Holy Spirit is tabernacled in your heart, one of the things that God must do is to, is to break, is to destroy your inclination towards rebellion so that you can begin to operate by Jesus' example, which is obedience. So he has to do that in you, fundamentally. If that is done in you, then you cannot be used as an instrument to bring obedience to God among the nations. You see, what God has not done in you, he cannot do through you, unfortunately. Now, as the influence of the Holy Spirit begins to grow on your life, you become a more potent messenger of the kingdom. And Jesus was trying to reveal to them how that the kingdom that is set up in the hearts of men can grow, the influence of that kingdom can grow so much in him, such that he becomes a functionary that is released into the nations to make the entire world bow down to the king that sits in his heart. And because of how, um, how mysterious this system is, Jesus had to come to do this capacity building program so that they will understand how the kingdom of God can extend upon the face of the earth. How the kingdom of God can extend. So the golden doctrine of scripture is kingdom. Every other thing, and in this kingdom there are many teachings. Are you with me? For instance, the Bible is not a book of holiness. But the Bible teaches holiness. The Bible is not a book of prosperity. 
But the Bible teaches prosperity. The Bible is not a book of faith. But the Bible teaches faith. The Bible is a book of the kingdom. And in this kingdom, are you here? In order for you to be reasonable, given the kind of investment God has made to procure your salvation, according to the book of Romans chapter 12, you will need to accept to consecrate yourself to God. That you'll be separated unto God. That even though the flesh can walk, operate through you, you'll not allow the flesh to use this your theater. And your theater is altogether dedicated to God. And it will become an instrument through which only God can find expression. That's consecration. The direct result of consecration is holy living. Are you with me? And because our God is not physical, our God has decided to shut himself into the spirit realm. You have to need faith in dealing with him. All of these things are, are conduments of, of the kingdom. But what God is pioneering is what is, the, is his kingdom upon the face of the earth. So if you decide now and say, okay, I'm a holiness preacher. And you stay on holiness, as you stay on holiness, are you with me? You will soon enter into error. As noble as your intention was to become a holiness preacher, you are still you are going to enter into error. As noble as your intention might be to be a prosperity preacher, that's what I'm called to do. And you are doing that in isolation of the other condiments in the ecosystem. You are soon going to be preaching materialism without knowing it. And some of you are already limited by um, the prism of discipleship that you have received. And if you are going to be a kingdom functionary, you must attend this Jesus school. And then Jesus shows you the scope of the engagement that is before us. And the tools that are required in order for us to prosecute it. If you are still with me, say Amen. amen. Because it is a kingdom that you are relating with, your, your prayer is only effective to the degree to which it is consistent with the will of God. Oh, you are not following. I'm just trying to balance a few things and then to show you the broad picture, the big picture. And then you will now discover, when you see the big picture, you will now discover that you need to be in this college, kingdom college that Jesus established. That is when we will now qualify to begin to touch on the issues that Jesus raised. One of the evidences to show that your conception of the kingdom is not accurate is that you become territorial and localized. And if we take that your thing to Japan, it will not sell. So most of what we build in the context of the Nigerian discipleship are things that are only relevant in our own territory. And that's a departure from the manual. Because the manual produced and provided for a template that is applicable in every territory. And that manual was not reviewed at any time. So first of all, the first thing you need to escape from is an attempt to specialize. No. And that's the reason why my brother this morning said, we need to see, you will read, oh, in knowing God, in doing his will, you will have to be very vast. When you hear some people talk politics, you will think they are politicians. When you hear them talk science, innovations, new discoveries in the scientific world, you would think they read all the journals in the science world of discovery. You will have to be very vast for you to be a competent functionary of the kingdom. You have to be very vast in the word of God, not streamlining yourself. Say, okay, this is where I'm called to you. In that thing you claim to be called to do, the, all, every other thing is involved if that thing is going to work. Because faith works by love. Faith, eh, there are so many principles that are, So you will, you will do everything. If at the end of the day you find yourself doing everything, even though you claim that it is just this area, if you want to do it accurately, you find all that tributaries that are connected to that which uh, uh, you claim that God has called you to do. And at the end of the day, you will still be a general practitioner.
So one of the things that happened to us was this streamlining of truth that me, I'm an expert in deliverance, so I don't know about the other. No, the other, meet experts in the other side. So you now find this person in the name of deliverance doing extra scriptural things and claiming that it is his expertise that gave him access to those dimensions. Meanwhile, he's already in error just because he had decided to specialize. And when you go to several countries, they will tell you, are you with me? Somebody says, okay, it's an expert in prosperity. And then you now go to Sweden, the economy is good, everything is good. They don't, they don't have no need for what you are doing. So do not specialize. Be a man of the kingdom. And the kingdom contains many truths. And you need to become an expert in those truths that the kingdom consists of. So that you can see that the goal, the goal of this school that Jesus established is to ensure that every functional, functionary of the kingdom understands the scope of engagement. And just like we said, the scope of engagement has to be a global thing. So if you preach a message here, what's the name of this place? Okay, that name you called now. If, if you preach a message here and we put it on YouTube, people from all over the nations should be wanting to listen to that message because it's an accurate kingdom delivery. So everybody, every Christian in any part of the world can be admonished by what you are teaching. Do you understand that? Even though it was in a remote place at the backside of nowhere, but what you were implementing is relevant to the globe, is relevant to your generation. So you are not preaching a message that is only relevant to the people because of, okay, their, their challenge is insecurity. So you now become a master of insecurity because that is what I'm an insecurity preacher trying to provide perspective of how God can intervene in the lives of insecure people and bring protection to them. So you now major there. And then when they now you shoot it on the internet, people will now wonder if you are, if you are, you are okay. They should test you for psychiatric departures. Because that thing you are doing may make sense where you are. But the kingdom was not designed to make sense only where you are. It was designed to make sense globally. Are you with me? Once upon a time in the line of duty, I worked, I was a regulator in one of the multinational companies. And I was there for one year. Are you with me? And when I came as a regulator, in that company, you are not allowed to take your phone beyond the gate. They have a vault where you will, they will tag your phone and keep it. You don't use phones. Alright? But we that are regulators will say, they will call us, they will call us, they will call us from our office. So we were the only ones entitled to phones in the complex. Are you with me? Number two, the moment you sit on your table, they give you a glass of milk because of the toxic nature of the environment that we're operating in. Say, guy, we're enjoying here. They, they are not giving you for enjoyment. They are giving you because the environment is polluted. And when you take this, it will reduce the impact of the kind of stuff you are inhaling over time. You understand that? Number three, we had safety meetings every Monday. So all the accident or near accident scenarios that took place throughout the week, we come and discuss them and then find solutions to them before the real accident will take place. So everybody is conscious of how to prevent an accident, how to prevent every Monday we we'll go for that training. Having attended the training for one year, I became a safety expert. That not consciously, it was seeping into my bones unconsciously, and then I became alarmed. Even in my own house, I started doing some safety things which resulted from that training. So I thought that was how the everywhere was until they posted me to a company owned by a man from Ondo State in Nigeria here. Then I met a, a different world. 
Because in that place, while we are climbing petroleum tanks to take dippings, there's somebody using his phone on the tank. You are not with me. <laughs> no, the tank farm, he, not just the tank farm area, is on the tank giving report that, yes, they didn't steal the product. Um, it's still 11.4. On the tank. So the difference between the two is one, the carelessness of the territory has affected the way some people operate. And these people, irrespective of territory, they are operating according to standard. So you, well, you know who you are. The trend may have influenced you and given you a voice that is like the trend, like the location. But what Jesus came to sell to his apostles was global best practices. And that was why the first thing he revealed to them was that your engagement is global. There were messages we preached in the village and he blessed people in the village. And then many years later, they now put it on some of those platforms and then people from the United States, people from everywhere, it was because what we did in the village was according to international best practices. And I need to show you what international best practices mean in this context. Are you still with me? Hi. Some of you are not following me. International best practices. Number one. The message you preach cannot be separated from the life that you live. How did I get that? The former traitor so Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. In fact, the hard copy of your message is your character. If it is true that the authority of the Lord is growing on your heart, then the implication is that it will affect your conduct. Because the Holy Spirit is not only sensitive on your, what, how you relate as a person, it's also sensitive to how you relate to other people. There was once upon a time, there was this tailor that made some clothes for me and I didn't like it. And then I called him and said, what, what kind of stuff? I rebuked him. And then after rebuking him, the Lord said, call him back and apologize. Don't speak like that. My clothes, my money. Say, don't speak like that. That there are better ways of experiencing your grievances, not this way. So, call, so I had to call the guy. I said, well, it's not my will to call you back. The Lord. You know what? The Lord is going to chisel your life. And if it is true that you are working with the Lord, then your character, your lifestyle is going to reflect it. So according to international best practices, your lifestyle is a hard copy of your message. And just in case we see someone that is in this congregation right now, and uh, you, have, you are a wonderful preacher, but you are overly taken by anger on ground. It means you don't have the power to live what you are preaching. So what you are preaching is a lie. It's not life applicable. So we have so many liars preaching. And that's why what you preach doesn't have the power to impart life. It didn't come from the well of life. It came from the well of study. And since it's not coming from the well of life, it's not something that has been processed by the authority of God. So it cannot impart what it says. It means you are localized. You are a man of unclean lips because you dwell among the people of uncleanness. The environment has made you a picture that is a departure from international best practices. Now, the company I said I was a regulator in is Total. Total. So I was in their depot in Lagos. Are you with me? Now, the things we're doing in Total Lagos is the same thing you will do in in France. The same things we're doing. 
It was not limited to, it was a, it, the best, best, see, okay. I was in a meeting and they were talking about gas, this gas cylinder. <laughs> and there was an elaborate procedure as to how to move gas, gas, a gas cylinder from point A to point B. There is a procedure, you must do it like that. Because research has revealed that that way that is prescribed in the manual is the best way to do it. Even though there are other ways, you can't do it to time. You must do it according. So, before they do something in the company, they will ask, what's the procedure for all this? Then the, the engineer will come and say, according to. They have documents, they have. So, after receiving training from that place one year, when I went out, I was an expert regulator because I was trained, I functioned in a place where the best practices were practiced. So, when I came to a place where there was a departure from, I could identify that you guys are not. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So your life is a hard copy of your message. And it's not in every, every circumstance you have an opportunity to preach. Sometimes the only opportunity you have is just to live the life that is, is pampered by the authority of God. Like, for instance, that tailor, when I called that tailor and apologized, and I said, well, it was difficult for me to apologize in the first place. But I said, I'm the Lord, said I should get back to you. And then the guy now wondered, and I said, wow, the Lord. Because obviously he has not known the Lord in that way. That the Lord can. The Lord. The Lord asked him to call me back. Hallelujah. And that was something, it was an experience for him anyway. But I was just trying to line up, even though it was on head of. Well, I was trying to line up. I was trying to line up with authority. Meanwhile, when I called him back, that my calling him back shined on him. It shined on him. It, it led him to meditation, led him to thinking. And he, those things he did that I was rebuking him for, he, 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 he adjusted because of a phone call. It was not a message. It was just a phone call just to obey my king. And that reflected on him and made him adjust his own life. So your character is a hard copy. Of your message. Second thing about international best practices. That Jesus unveiled here is that uh, the things that God does in the lives of men is consistent to a certain calendar in heaven. <laughs> I know some of you are praying, Lord, give me a life partner. Some of these issues are calendar based. Okay. Let me. Hallelujah. Are you in verse 7? Acts chapter 1, verse 7. Because when they came back, 6 and 7. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Now, if underline times and underline seasons. Now, these times and seasons, the things they were asking about was consistent to times and seasons that were held up under the authority of God. There were some anointings I prayed for. I prayed for these anointings when I was on campus. That if only I could operate in this anointing. I'll bring this school at your feet. You know that. Just release this thing. Let me begin to do some. Hallelujah. But you see, the issues I was talking about was held up in a calendar. There is a season. There is a time for it. And according to the Lord, that time was not the time. So that prayer was off timing. The Bible says, and thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, because the time to favor her, ye, the set time is come. You see, are you with me? It's the time to favor her. Now, Israel can be praying for favor when it's not consistent with timing. 
and God will not manifest it. You might even pray and cry and weep and you are depressed. It won't happen. There is a calendar that God works with. And if you, if you begin to walk with God, are you? Oh my, you're not with me. You know, I said if you underline two things there. Eh? I'm going to explain that before we move on. I will explain that before we move on. When I was cutting my wife, my wife told me that she was in a service. You know this service that power is flowing, people are falling. So power now hit her. From the time she was standing erect to the time she fell, she had a vision. Her own, the power produced a vision. May, may the power that is flowing produce vision in your life. Right. So from the time the power hit her till when she hit the ground, she had a vision and she saw a school. And she believed that God wanted her to run a school in the future. It was that power deposit that brought wisdom. Because the profit in wisdom is his is ability to give direction. So when we were cutting, she told me that she has a vision for a school. And I think she understood it. I said, alright, no problem. My own duty will be to pave way for the fulfillment of this your vision in the fullness of time. Are you with me? As much as we wanted to implement the vision, the first limitation that I had was finances. Finances. The only thing I had finances for when we initially got married was to buy bits and pieces of land. We're buying that bits and pieces. We're buying that bits and pieces. So we now had a sizable land where the school could be situated. Are you with me? Alright. So, we now had a, a sizable land where the school could be um, situated. And that was what we had the ability for at that time. Then, one day, in, in prayer, the Lord now said, begin to build now. It was not as if the money was there. But, According to the calendar, he says what? Now you are not following. Let's go back to verse 7. I'm just showing you international best practices. You have a... <laughs> there's a mistake I made that I don't want you to make. That's why I'm here. If not, my message is different too. This message I'm preaching now is not on my script. The one on my script is the meaning of power. The meaning... Power has a meaning, not what you think. I wanted to show you. Because in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, according to Jesus, we cannot do this work, this work of affecting our generation without power. Alright? So I wanted to show you the meaning of power. And then the Holy Ghost now interrupted and this is where we are. Now listen. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. If you have an electronic Bible, you can click on times and click on seasons. You will now see that one is Kairos and the other one is Kronos. So in Greek, there are two words for time. Chronological time, which is Kronos. And opportune time, which is Kairos. Are you following? Now listen. Jesus said, Say ye not, yet four months and then the harvest. That means according to your own calendar, it is remaining four months before harvest time. Abi? He said, Lift up now thy eyes. That means consider God's own calendar. Don't look at your calendar. When you lift up your eyes to consider God's own calendar, you realize that the fields are already white on two harvests. He's talking about two calendars. The human calendar and oh, okay, you didn't hear. Okay, let's leave. Two calendars. And if you are going to walk with the kingdom, walk with the king, operate as a kingdom functionary, you must understand the heavenly calendar. Because many things about the actualization of your purpose and your destiny are consistent with the divine calendar and not your own calendar. Now, when we got married, according to our own calendar, it was time for us to begin doing the school. 
And then as much as we tried, it did not come to pass. We prayed, it didn't come to pass. We labor, we worship. You know, all the things we say we normally do to move the hand of God. We were out of time. It was not the time. <laughs> Please help me tell your neighbor, God will use time to test you. So when we now say, okay, let that will be done, let that will be done, and we forgot about it. Then the Lord now came in his own time, consistent with his own calendar, and he now said, build. The time God said build, that was when one dollar was 500 naira. And no strategic person will begin to build then. Especially if you didn't steal the money. Because iron rods had gone astronomical. Every but I heard the Lord say, What? Deal. Then we started. In obedience. The reason why it worked when it was out of season in human calendar. Are you with me? Was because what? We were on schedule in the divine calendar. And when a time comes in God's calendar for the actualization of a particular purpose, the grace of God will begin to flow. The power of God will begin to flow. Most of the time, we are trying to achieve things that God is not doing. You will never find grace. You want to marry when God is, has not approved. You will have a challenge. So kingdom people are people that align with divine timing. Because God wants to establish a history within human history. The history of the tale of God among men. Eh? Inside of human history. And if we are going to be part of the functionaries that will bring the history of God into human history, you must be on schedule. God will test you with time. He will try you with time. Until... You begin to understand where wisdom truly lies. You do not have access to true wisdom until you know divine time. The sons of Isaac, they were men that understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do. Sometimes prophecy can be a snare. Because prophecy came that I'm going to preach internationally. To whites and blacks and everybody. And then there's a temptation for you to want to bring it to pass. Outside of timing. Where there's no grace. And then you will not discover the flesh. A prophet's not. Even if you succeed in doing that outside of time. That your success is failure. Because when the season comes, then grace begins to flow. And God showed me a great lesson. We were able to put up that building and start that school in spite of the rise, the fall in the Naira. So it was not about the status of the Naira or the economy. It was about the timing of God. Anything is possible when it is consistent with timing. Anything. I remember I wanted to marry at the age of 30 so that you'd be on record that on 30 I married because I wrote a chart of how the progression of my life should be. Um, uh, hallelujah. And uh, 30 years was assigned to marriage. Then I was cleaning my car in the morning and the Lord said, you will not marry this year. I bound the voice. I said. <laughs> but even though I was binding the voice, the voice was still talking. The, the voice said, your marriage is next year when you are 31. I said, no. There's nothing wrong. Is, it, is there anything wrong? Meanwhile, I had the money to marry. I had everything to marry but the only thing was that her parents didn't accept and you know what for that whole year that i was planning to marry at 30 so that it would be on record i had the resources so i was saying what's going to stop me i didn't know that her parents won't agree and her parents remained adamant until that one year expired then i now went i said <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it means my effort amounted to nothing. And I'm decide I now became wise enough now to surrender to God's timing. Because the Bible says it's not for you to know the timings 
or the seasons which God has set in his own authority. There's that element of the test of time in kingdom actualizations. You must be found doing what God is doing. Don't be found doing what God is not doing. Meanwhile, I said, if you check the lexicon, you are going to find that the word time and season is chronos and kairos. It means human timing has chronos and kairos, and divine timing has chronos and kairos. What's the meaning of that? Kairos talks about the opportune time. How many of you have planted maize before? Have you ever planted maize? Because the way I'm seeing you guys, it seems you grow up in, in, in Chicago. How many of you have cultivated maize and you ate the maize? Okay, that's better. That's better. Um, how many months between germination and harvest? Three months. Okay. So the three months that you had to wait from the time you planted to the time that it was harvest, that three months you had to wait. Do you realize that you can't take prayer to change it? It is fixed. <laughs> you don't have authority over that. <laughs> it's fixed. So that the, the three months is chronos. And then the one week of harvest is kairos, opportune time. Do you get that? This chronological time leading to what? Opportune time. How many of you went uh, to boarding school? When is dining? Evening dining? 6 p.m. Any reason why you are not in the dining by 6 is the reason why you missed the meal. Because that's the kairos time. You can miss Kairos time. You cannot miss Kronos. But you can miss Kairos time. Meanwhile, if you don't know how to use your Kronos time, effectively you will miss Kairos. Are you with me? Okay. Now, I'm sure you are with me now. Guess what? Demons will not attack you during Kronos. Demons will attack you during Kairos time. He said, I will restore unto you the years that the caterpillar, the palma worm, the canker worm, and the locusts have eaten. Those locusts, they ate years, not grass. Eh? Those ones, the ones spoken about in the Bible, they ate what? Yes. So those are time thieves. These time thieves, this and the sequence in which they were mentioned was consistent to their devouring power. I will restore to you the years that they what? Which one is the first? Ah. Uh, huh? No. Is it Kanka that is first? Palma. Those ones, the devouring ability is restricted. Huh? Okay, let's check the scripture. Which one is first? Oh, sorry, they were listed in descending order of consuming ability. Because the locust is the one that eats more. If a swarm of locusts will invade this place, they can torment every green thing. So let's assume, this is a, this is a assumption, eh? Assumption. Let's assume that locusts eat five years. Five, five years. That's what they eat. So somebody is in a relationship, is tending a damn cell, tending a damn cell, tending a damn cell for five years, and then the damn cell say, No! That's locusts. <laughs> ah! I can sell him that's a locust. <laughs> That's an attempt of locust. He has eaten up by five years. 
May the Lord deliver all the brothers in the name of Jesus. You will not be a victim of locusts.